computational computing. How the Human Brain Project can contribute to a fundamentally new paradigm of information processing. Karl Heinz Meyer, the Human Brain Project and Universität Heidelberg. When the wall came down, I worked deep underground in an experiment at CERN in Geneva. There's actually a piece missing of the statement I made when I worked down there in Geneva. I said that we started to discuss the effects of the changes in Europe and I said most of my predictions were wrong. So I'm terribly bad at making predictions and today I want to try once more. Uh, I will start with a photo that has been taken 60 years ago. It shows two physicists actually at the Princeton Institute of Advanced Science studies and it's uh, John von Neumann on the left and uh, Robert Oppenheimer on the right and they are standing in front of a really strange device it's made out of funny objects and it is in fact one of the first programmable digital computers and Robert Oppenheimer used it to simulate neutron diffusion he also applied it to weather prediction already and John von Neumann is the architect of that machine and he designed what is now called the von Neumann architecture and which has with some deviations survived until today. It's actually in all our cell phones and these machines are amazing in terms of their capabilities and computer scientists like to measure the performance of computers in flops. Uh, so this cell phone for example the graphics part of it is able to do 80 billion flops. What does that mean? That's a flop. Okay, so you just add two numbers, you get a result, and that is called a floating point operation. Now, there are much bigger machines, of course, which you have seen. There is one in Germany, the U Queen computer, which is doing six petaflops. Okay, so you can count the zeros, so it's a lot more. And uh, these machines are used to run simulations, and we will see more about simulations later in this session. Of course, the topic I'm going to talk about is this object here. And you may ask yourself, how many flops does it have? And it's easy to measure. I mean, if I would not have written the result on this little piece of paper sitting on the cell phone, you could do it by yourself. And what do you think? How, how long would it take you to do this addition? Probably a couple of seconds or so. So if you are really good, you probably are at one flop. So the brain is a real flop in terms of computing. Now, we all know, of course, that that's not really the case. In fact, the brain can do amazing things. And I want to summarize this in three aspects, which I would even claim solve all the problems that modern computing has today. And the three problems are power, are software, and are fault tolerance or sensitivity to faults. What, I'm, what do I mean by that? In terms of power, of course, we know that the brain is an amazingly efficient device. You can do your own measurement, just put your hand uh, to your brain and you measure it's like a, an old-fashioned light bulbs, those which are forbidden by now, uh, of typically 20 watts or so. Uh, we know that the brain doesn't need software. In fact, it can learn from data. You can build your own models of the world and you can make predictions, which is a very powerful thing you really would like to have in synthetic computers. And finally, often not so much seen, is the resilience of the fault tolerance. We are losing neurons at a rate of about one to two hertz. That's 100,000 a day. And still, although we know that aging is a problem, we can still work quite reasonably even at my age, for example. And so these three aspects are quite impressive and it's clear that it would be just wonderful to have those aspects in uh, future computers. If we go a little bit deeper, and uh, the previous picture was on a scale of, I would say, a meter or 10 centimeters, and now we go down many orders of magnitude, and we look to the micrometer scale. And the picture on the left has been taken from a device like the iPhone, for example, and the one on the right is a reconstructed circuit uh, of the cortex of a rat. And what you see is that there are quite some fundamental differences. Whereas the standard computer, the traditional computer, the microprocessor, the microscopic image looks like the picture of a city, I would say. It looks like there are buildings and roads. 
And that's actually what it is. There are specialized little buildings in which special jobs are being done. Data is being stored, data is being processed, and the roads in between are there to shift the data around. And all these buildings fulfill a special purpose. If you look to the biological system, it's different in the sense that it looks pretty uniform. There is some structure, some layered structure which you see, but otherwise there doesn't seem to be a lot of specialization. And that's quite interesting. Uh, now, the fact that we know about the substructure of the brain, that it is made of cells and connection between cells, goes back to Ramon Icajal, who at the beginning of the 20th century, with the help of staining techniques developed by Golgi, showed us that the brain is made out of discrete cells that communicate over a distance. And today, what we can do is to use images like that, and even the ancient images taken by Golgi and, and Cajal, and to reconstruct cells, to reconstruct neural cells in terms of their morphology, that means the way they connect their size, uh, the way they spread out in the network, but also, which is not visible on this picture, in terms of their electric features, like, for example, the voltages between the inside and the outside, which travel through the network. So, with these kind of computer reconstructions, and the right one is actually a computer reconstruction of a real Golgi image, we can do the following. We can take those cells, put them into a volume, and see how they connect, and we can start to build networks. And the fact that this picture is so nice and colorful is not just for beauty, but it really carries a message. It carries the message of electric activity in a system like that. Now, we can make these systems bigger, this is work done by Markram's lab at the EPFL in Lausanne. This is the so-called cortical column of a rat's brain, which is made of 10,000 neurons, and there are about 1,000 to 10,000 inputs, synaptic inputs per neuron. So that's great, and so we have a model of these brain circuits, and I said that before, we have extremely powerful computers. And the fact that you have these computers has already been exploited by many other areas of science, like astrophysics, for example. These are two pictures of galaxies. The amazing thing is that one of them is a photo and the other one is a simulation. And so you can actually try to understand the emergence of structure by using high-performance computers. Uh, what is it that you have to know? Well, of course, you have to know the laws of physics. And you may say, well, for galaxies, that's all known. It's mostly, it's mostly gravity. There is angular momentum conservation, maybe a little bit of hydrodynamics, and you switch it on and you get a galaxy. That is actually not true, because there are parts of the universe which we didn't understand. We just heard that there is dark matter, and it turns out to understand the structure of the universe, you have to put in dark matter. And one way to study that, if you do not find these things at accelerators or in earthbound experiments, you can put them in a simulation and you have a little slider. You can see this as a slider and you switch on the dark matter and you switch it off and you see how the structure changes. Why am I telling this story? I'm telling this story because I claim that you can do simulations even if you do not understand the science of the systems you simulate. You can use the simulations to gain understanding. And that's, of course, also the hope for brain simulations. Now, this is a simulation of the cortical column I have just shown you before, and the nice flashing lights now are actually spiking activities, action potentials emerging from those cells. So this is a wonderful thing. And you say, well, now the next step is just to make this thing bigger and to see what it does. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. And the reason is that uh, to do this simulation, people in Lausanne have used a supercomputer that has an electrical power consumption of about 100 kilowatt. If you scale this thing up to the full brain, you would end up at 1,000 gigawatts. Okay, that's about five times the electrical power installed in this country, and it's definitely not feasible at all. There is even a, w and, and, and if, you, if you calculate uh, how much that is in terms of some maybe more reasonable uh, units, uh, you are listening to me now for 15 minutes, and the energy your brain needs to listen to me to 15 minutes and to maybe think a little bit about what I say corresponds to the amount of yogurt that is in one of these spoons. If you would operate a computer that simulates your thinking during, uh, during these uh, 15 minutes, you would need an amount of yogurt which corresponds to this uh, the mass of this aircraft carrier. So there is definitely a problem with energy, but there is another problem as well. And that's the problem of time. To simulate an hour, and of course an hour is an important time, for example, for learning and development, to simulate 24 hours, one day, 
you need typically three years. And this is because these simulations are much slower than the actual process in biology. Simulations are slow and they are very energy intensive. Now if we look a little bit in detail to the structure of cells, you see that they are basically electrical devices. There are currents flowing, there are capacitors, and there are two ways to treat this. You can write down an equation. It's a terrible thing. There is an equation on the right here. And this is what you solve on a computer. What you can also do is to take little electronic circuits and to build a copy, a physical copy of neural cells. And uh, so we are doing this in the Human Brain Project. And what you see here is a chip design. It's as thin as a hair and has a length of maybe 200 micrometers or something like that. And that is a physical model of a neuron. It's made of 300 transistors. And now the trick is if you have one, you can also make two, and maybe you can make four and six and eight and 10 and 12. And that's already a lot. So you could put many of them on what we call a microchip. And in fact, most of this area in this microchip is then taken by connections, not by the neurons. And then you can produce this microchip and you have a little physical model of a brain circuit. Now you see that this thing is not really scalable. You see these little wires emerging from the chip. That means if you want to build bigger systems, you have to connect those wires and build very large scale systems. That's not very convenient. So what we do in the Human Brain Project, we uh, take those chips which are delivered by the company and the company doesn't deliver chips, they deliver wafers. And so the question is why do you cut these wafers into pieces if you want to connect them afterwards in any case. So we leave the wafers intact, we build a system like that, and we operate it. A physicist builds something that looks like this. It's a, it's a mess. You have to connect it to the outside world. You have to send data in and read that data out, and you have a, ma a physical model of a brain circuit. Is this really solving problems? Is it, using, is it solving energy problems? Well, actually it does. If you look to the energy that is needed for a simulation of a synaptic transmission, it's typically a joule for a high-performance computer simulation, and it's about 10 to the minus 10 joule for the physical model system. More importantly, these systems can be accelerated. That means time in systems like that is not the time that is imposed by a clock like on the computer, but is imposed by the time constants of the physical components like the transistors and the capacitors. So if you build the right components, you can build a system that is accelerated, for example, accelerated by a factor of 10,000. So you use 10 to the minus 10 times the energy and you do the simulation 10,000 10, times faster than nature. Uh, so a day, for example, is compressed to about 10 seconds. Uh, what can you do with it? Well, for example, there is this nice animal, the barn owl. And as I cannot see you with all these light blinding me, also the barn owl in the dark cannot really locate the mouse by looking at the mouse, but it can do it by using acoustical signals. And it has developed a very clever way of doing that by using the time difference. The, the, the mouse is this little black dot there, and you see that the path to the right ear and the left ear is different, and the, the neural circuit of the barn owl has learned to compensate for that time difference by very clever learning algorithms. So experiments like that can be implemented in these physical systems, and they can, for example, be used to do navigation in cars. Let me close my presentation by making a little comment on the Human Brain Project. What I explain to you is just one little aspect of the Human Brain Project. It's the end product in the way. It's the circuits that arise from the studies that other people in the project do. The project has been approved in the beginning of this year. It has been running now since October. And it's really a collaboration of neuroscientists, engineers, mathematicians, and physicists. And the workflow is that we start from biological data. We use the biological data to build models, to build models that we can simulate on conventional supercomputers. We will then reduce the complexity of the cell models and we put it into what we call physical models, which at the end are computers like the ones I just described. Thank you very much.